If you are a PA who is considering taking the Panry LA, or maybe you've already signed up for it, but you're a little nervous and don't know what to expect, then you are in the right place. This video is for you. Hi, my name is Michelle and I'm a PA, and this is The Medicine Couch. On my channel, I normally talk to PAs and NPs about all of the different opportunities we have in medicine, but sometimes I talk about PA-specific topics like the Panry LA. I actually have already made five separate videos about the Panry LA, talking about the test when it first came out and walking you through my journey of actually taking the test. I'm one year in now. I have one more year to go. And those videos are very informative, but I know not everyone wants to sit through five separate videos and some of the materials a little repetitive between them. So I went through and I kind of combined all of the videos into one. So this is a combination video. You'll see me in different outfits and it's gonna pretty much answer every question you have about the Panry LA from deciding between the Panry LA and the Panry, what the test dashboard looks like and how the test is set up and how it works to my feedback from taking the test and what I've thought about it over the year and also listing some of the best resources you can use for the test if you need to study ahead of time or not, and then just general test taking tips that I've learned along the way. So I think this will be really informative and really help you out and hopefully ease any anxiety you might have. Okay, now let's dive in and learn all about the Panry LA. First, let's talk about the similarities between the Panry and the Panry LA. The main similarity is the content. They both cover the same core blueprint, cover the same general cross-section of medicine. They also both come to you for the very low, low price of only $350 per test. Yes, that was a little bit of sarcasm in case you can't read my face. Bingo! So now let's talk about what the differences are between the two. Well, first of all, the regular Panry is a 240 question test. It's administered over a five hour window and you have to go to Pearson View official testing centers to have it done. The test is pretty fast paced. It comes out to about one minute per question. And of course, you cannot use any resources or have anything with you when you go take the test. When you're done, you don't really get an immediate feedback about questions you've gotten wrong or right, and you won't know if you passed or failed for about two weeks. Now, the Panry LA, and by the way, LA stands for Longitudinal Assessment, is a much more flexible test. It is broken into 25 question exams that are given per quarter over a minimum of eight quarters, which is two years or a maximum of 12 quarters, which is three years. So that means that the entire exam consists of 200 questions versus the 240 for Panry. Now you do have flexibility on what quarters you want to be doing the exam. If you have something coming up, a trip plan or a big family event, and you know you're not gonna have time that quarter, you can just defer the test for that quarter and pick it up the next quarter that you have available. The only requirements are that you do at least one quarter in the first year and then one quarter in the second year. And of course, you have to have a minimum of eight passing quarters. You take the exam completely online, the comfort of your own home, and you can do it on just about any device that you can access the internet. So on your phone, your tablet, or laptop or desktop computer. You can also log in and out of the exam. It does not have to be done in one session, which is also really nice. And probably the biggest thing that separates it from the regular Panry is that you can use resources. It is perfectly allowed. You can use written and online resources. You just can't phone a friend. In fact, discussing the actual content or sharing the content online in any way is a violation of the exam policies and could put you in trouble with NCCPA and cause you to face some disciplinary actions, including the possibility of having your certification revoked. Another great thing is you get immediate feedback on the questions, whether you answered it right or wrong. If it's wrong, they'll tell you what the right answer is and why the other questions are wrong. They'll also give you reference material to point you to some further study so that you can really learn that material and really understand it, which after all is the point of doing these recertification exams. So that also means that you'll kind of know how you did each quarter, although you won't get any kind of pass fail scores, you'll get a preliminary score. If you have successfully passed the standards for all eight quarters, then you're done and you're certified. If you haven't, then you continue 
testing each quarter until you either have eight successfully passed quarters or until you have failed out after the 12 quarters. Now, if you do fail, then you still have the option of taking the PANRI. You'll have a year and you'll have three attempts within that year to actually pass. Now, what if you register, but then you change your mind? Well, you can submit a withdrawal request and you can get a refund as long as it's done before January when the test officially launches. Now, if you change your mind after January, then you can still withdraw out of the process, but you will not get any kind of refund. And then at that point, you'll be subject to taking the regular PANRI in whatever your PANRI testing cycle is. One thing to know is that you cannot work ahead with the PANRI LA. So if you finished your quarter's questions, you cannot go on and do any of the other quarters. They have to be done in each quarter. The reason for that, NCCPA says, is that they want to space out the learning and space out the questions so that you actually can retain more of the information. Now, one thing that's kind of great about the way the Panry LA is designed is that they will tell you the content category for each question and whether that question contains an image or not. That way, if you feel like you don't know much about that category and really want to go study before attempting the question, you can do so. Or if you're on your phone, and it's got an image, you may want to log out and log back on a different device where you can have a better view of that image. A lot of the comments that I read from people who took the Panry LA pilot said that they did not really have much trouble finding the answers in the five minute time frame that you're given. So some people are advising that you don't even study before you sit down to answer the questions. Just have your resources ready and go search for the answer. You have to make sure that you select some answer within the five minute window, because if you select an answer, even if you don't hit submit, you'll still have a chance. They will still grade that answer. But if you don't have anything selected and your five minutes is up, that answer is automatically counted as incorrect and you don't get a chance to do that question again. And along the same lines, any questions that you like forget to get to or just run out of time to do, in that quarter will automatically be counted as incorrect as well. So who is the Panry LA good for? Obviously I would say for anyone that has test anxiety, that when you get in a testing center in that high pressure environment, you have a hard time taking tests, or if you just don't like sitting through a five hour exam, then the Panry LA is probably for you. And it's also a good option for those who don't wanna spend a bunch of time studying all at once for a big test that would rather have things broken out into smaller, more manageable chunks. It's also great for the people who live in more rural areas, far away from testing facilities. Having to drive two to three hours for a testing facility, then sit for five hours taking a test, and then drive home for several hours does not sound like a fun or healthy day to me. And for those who just like to always be comfortable, you can't get any more comfortable than taking the Panry LA at home in your pajamas. Now, who is the Panry LA not good for? First of all, it's not even possible for people who need to recertify after a lapsed certification. If you don't have stable internet connection where you live, or if you are worried about technical problems, then you may want to pass on the Panry LA as well. NCCPA says that if you get disconnected while you're doing a question, or if you have any kind of technical issues, the question that you're on will be counted as incorrect and there's nothing that they can do about it. You're just kind of out of luck at that point. So if that's the thing that worries you, then you might want to do the PANRI in person. And finally, the PANRI LA is not for people who don't want to have to work on something over the next two to three years. If you want to study all at once, get the thing knocked out in one to two months, then the PANRI LA is not the best option for you. So when does the Panry LA officially start? Well, registration is open in July and it will close in November, November 30th. So if you want to do the Panry LA, you do need to register by November 30th of 2022. And the test will start in January of 2023. If you're a PA who is going to be taking the new Panry LA, I'm going to tell you what the most suggested study courses are for the exam what resources you should have open during the exam, and some tips and advice from people who already took the pilot Panry LA. Plus, 
towards the end of the video, I'm going to let you know what I have gathered in all my research about whether people think you should study for the Panry LA at all, whether it's even necessary to do any kind of studying before you sit down and take this open book test. So stay tuned to find out all of the information that I gathered. Full disclosure, I have not taken the pilot Panry LA, but I have spent lots of time scouring through social media posts, um, forums, anywhere I could find where people talked about their experience taking the pilot Panry LA, and I'm gonna be sharing what I found with you. There are a ton of resources that you can use to study, but I'm gonna be talking about the ones that I saw mentioned most often. Three of the four review courses I'm going to highlight are actually run by PAs, which is pretty exciting and pretty cool. Um, and it's nice to know that we're supporting a fellow colleague. The first one I'm gonna talk about is CME for Life. This is predominantly a video review-based course that follows the NCCPA blueprint pretty stringently. That is one of the things that they stress is that they are giving you the meat and potatoes, what you absolutely need to know. John Belinsky is the PA that runs this program and he has his own YouTube channel. So you can watch his videos to get an idea of how he teaches and if you like that style and if it's the right choice for you. Now he has a variety of options that you can choose from, from the full course down to a study guide and then down to some flashcards. So you do have some price point options. They range, I think, from like 99 to a little over 800 for the full entire package. He does also offer a few limited in-person courses, so you can check that out as well if you like to go and just over a couple of days just get the review course done. This course does qualify for Category 1 CME credit, so that's also another bonus. The second course is by Smarty Pants, P-A-N-C-E, kind of a cute play on the initial certification exam. Smarty Pants does have review courses specifically for Panry. And people may be confused if you go look and it says that it's just a Panry review course, you may be like, well, I need the Panry LA review course. But remember, both tests are operating off of the same NCCPA blueprint. So as long as it says Panry somewhere in it, it's going to be the course that you need. Now, the Smarty Pants review course, they have some video lectures and some audio lectures, which are kind of nice because you can listen to those in your car. But this is pretty much a question review based program. You can go to their website and you can see some samples of how they run through stuff. It's not as straightforward as they just ask you a question and give you the answer. They have some other more evolved tools there. They also have like an agreement with like Picmonic and some other things. If you're a visual learner and you like to, to look at cartoons and different drawings. The greatest thing probably about this course is the price point. You don't buy the course outright like you do at CMA for Life. You pay for a year membership, which is $79. Pretty great. For $79, you can have access to this course for the whole year. Uh, you can continually review questions and go through and use all of the resources that are available on the site. Now, if you don't want like a full year's access, you they do give you options for even cheaper access for just one month or three months. With that cheaper price, there is a downside. This is not eligible for Category 1 CME, but you can claim Category 2 for the amount of studying hours that you put in. The next course is Hippo Education's Panry Review course. In addition to the video lectures, they do have some practice questions, and they have some written summaries and some slides. The other thing about the Hippo Education is it is also done on a yearly membership, but that membership is $495 a year. So quite a bit more expensive than the Smarty Pants at $75 a year. Now the Hippo Education course does come with Category 1 CME. The last course I'm gonna mention is not really a course, it's a podcast, but it's the Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. This is a podcast put out by PA Brian Wallace, and he has been doing this podcast for many years. I remember listening to it when I was in PA school, preparing to go sit for the pants. This is a podcast, so it doesn't cost you anything, and it's something that you can listen to, you know, while you're driving or, you know, walking the dog or whatever. So that's a really nice aspect of it as well. The downside is that it's not like a structured course. He does follow the NCCPA blueprint. Now, each particular podcast covers a different topic. They're usually 20 to 40 minutes long, and he does a really good job of putting the titles on there so you know exactly what that particular podcast covers. 
So while it's not a structured course, you can go through the titles and look for exactly what you want to study. And finally, several people mentioned just kind of going through review books. Now let's talk about some of the test taking tips and strategies that people mention. The first one that I saw mentioned a lot was that they advise you use two screens, have a two screen setup, whether it's your phone and a desktop or phone and laptop or tablet and laptop, whatever. Um, although they did mention that the bigger the screen, the better. But then there were others that are like, oh, you're just making it too complicated, guys. All you have to do is open like some extra tabs and then you can search for, you know, a, an answer if you need to. But if you have a question open and you're searching for the answer and you accidentally close the exam tab, that question is going to be marked wrong because you had it open and you didn't give, you know, a correct answer. So I'm just going to use two tabs to make it simple and easy. Besides that, if you're searching for an answer, you may have forgotten exactly what the question is asking. You can just quickly glance back, see what the question was, and then look for your answers. People did talk too about scheduling tactic. I mean, it's 25 questions and you have a quarter, three months to answer those 25 questions. Even if you took the maximum amount of time to answer each question, so five minutes per question, that puts you at just a little over two hours. So even if you just picked one day and sat down and did all of the questions in one day, you know, you're looking at getting it done in just over two hours. But some people said that they like to do a question a day for 25 days. Some people would sit down and do like five questions at a time and just do that five different days of the quarter. Mainly, I just bring this up to remind you that this test is very flexible and you have complete control over how you want to do the exam every quarter. People also mentioned that if you miss a question, make sure that you really understand and do a little bit of um, learning and research about that question because the way the exam is set up and, the re and it's made for you to be able to learn is that that question will come back around at another time, maybe in a different form, but you will see that again. They also mentioned if you're somebody who's kind of an anxious test taker or if you're anxious about how fast you'll be able to look up these questions, then do some practice questions. Just find any medical questions somewhere that you come across um, and have them ready, have a timer, and then, you know, read a question, set your timer for five minutes, and then go searching and see if you can find the answer. They said that will give you an idea of just how long five minutes is and if you are capable and able to find an answer in that time. They said doing that a few times should reassure you that you will be able to verify the answer in the five minute time period. Now, what are the best resources to use while you actually are taking the test? Honestly, most people just said that they Googled the answer. So you should be able to find the answer readily in sources that come up with Google. If you want specific sources, some people said that they did use Medscape. They found that was useful or like Hippocrates. Now people talked about up to date. Some people used it, um, but most of the people said it's just far too clunky and there's too much information to be able to get through to really find just the answer you need in the five minute block. So you could try it, but most people said it's not even worth it. You can just Google. Now, the one resource that you can't use per NCCPA is like a phone a friend option. You're not allowed to get together with other PAs and take the test together. You are not allowed to call somebody and ask the answer. You know, they probably wouldn't find out, but if they did find out, then you risk some severe penalties and possibly even having your license revoked. So just not worth it. So really the big question is, do you even need to study for the Panry LA at all? Is it a test that you have to do a review course for or do a lot of studying for before you start taking it? Let me read you some of the quotes that pretty much sum up what most people have been saying who took the pilot. One said, I would suggest not studying at all for the Panry LA. If you aren't doing well on the first several questions, then close the test and go brush up on the areas that you need to review. Someone else said, I was worried too when I did my pilot. I didn't do a course or study ahead of time. I found that I either knew the answers or knew enough to get it narrowed down to two, and then I had time to Google the answer. Somebody else said, I work in a specialty and I have for the last 16 years, and I did fine on the pilot. Many of the blocks I was able to finish in 15 minutes. I really like this one. 
they said to those taking the Panry LA, relax, enjoy life, don't study. You will be just fine. And finally, someone says, you don't study for it. It was designed to test your knowledge and identify areas of weakness. It gives you immediate feedback and explanations of right and wrong answers, and it's a great way to recertify. I loved it, and I learned a ton. So the resounding answers from almost everyone that I read that took the pilot Panry LA was that, no, you do not have to study for this test ahead of time. Of course, I'm not saying whether you should or shouldn't study. That is completely up to you and your learning style and what you feel comfortable with. And studying and reviewing medicine is never wrong. I mean, it's just good for us and it helps reinforce our medical knowledge and helps us in our practice. But if you're the type of person who doesn't want to study, doesn't have the time to study, you'll probably do just fine taking the test and only looking up answers when you need to. Today, I am actually going to be taking the brand new Panry LA test and I'm going to take you along with me. I'm going to show you how you access the test, what you see once you open the test, what kind of information they give us before we open a question, how we bank questions. I'm also going to show you how I went about searching for answers and what resources I used. Now, a little disclaimer, obviously, NCCPA's policy is that you cannot share any of the actual test information. Okay, before I actually open the test, I just kind of want to talk about setup and how to get yourself organized and ready for it. First of all, I suggest you use two screens. For me, that's having my laptop set up and then I have a separate monitor attached to the laptop. But you can be using a computer, your laptop, and a tablet or a phone, whatever you want to do, but I suggest having two screens. Now, there's a couple reasons why I suggest you do it this way and have separate screens. Obviously, if you only have one computer or one screen, you can open the test and have different tabs open where you do your searching. My fear is that I would close a tab and accidentally close the test. Not a huge deal, but if you have the question open and you haven't selected anything and you accidentally close the tab, then you're going to get that question wrong. The other reason I think it's great to have two screens and keep them separate for searching and then for the test is that when you're doing the searching, you know, you only have five minutes, but if you can have the question pulled up and then be looking in your search resources and reference the question easily to see what you need to search for, that's going to make things a lot faster. So what do I have pulled up now on my computers? I have the NCCPA uh, website pulled up, ready to log into that. And then on where I'm going to be doing the search, I have a Google search page already open. And then I am using the Smarty Pants search features. Smarty Pants is a CME company that is started by a PA. And they have very affordable options for studying for the pants, the Panry, and the Panry LA. And they have the Panry LA blueprint in their database and it's searchable. So you can search any part of the blueprint and they've set it up where you can search lots of different ways and it'll take you right to the pearls and the things that you need to know. So I think that that's going to be pretty helpful. We'll see. I'll give you my impressions of it at the end of the video. So that is how I am set up to start the test. Now we're going to see what happens. Okay, so I'm here at the NCCPA website. I'm going to sign in. You're just going to go to your dashboard and then down under the my to-do list then you'll see the recertifying exam status and it says that I'm actively enrolled in the Panry LA and I can click here to go to the progress launch page. So this is the first time I am opening the test and looking at this. So it's showing me what quarter we're in here, how many questions I have not answered and how many questions I have. Obviously it's the first time opening it so there's zero for both of those. Here is the button where I'm going to launch the test. It tells me when this quarter is due by and how many days are left in this quarter. Now the tutorial here for, for the Panry LA exam is just a, like a five minute video. It actually has some really interesting information and they talk about how they actually figure the scoring because it's not a straight number of questions you have to get right out of so many. It's kind of based on how everyone does on the test. And then it talks about how that you will be asked to rate the questions when you're done and, and if you used resources and how confident you were in your answers. And they say that they use that to kind of determine 
the questions you get in the future and you should be really honest on those. So I, I encourage you to watch that video. And then down here is just the quarter progress and you can look at your cumulative progress here. It's important to know that when you hit this launch exam, you don't have to be all anxious when you do that because you're just going to get into the exam at that point. And the five minute time limit is not going to come into effect until you open a question. So let's go ahead and hit the launch exam and see what comes up here. So this is just the agreement, basically certifying that you're working independently, you're not going to receive assistance from others who are taking the test or have taken it, and then, like I said, not able to share the questions, answers, and the rationales with people, and then the threat at the end that if you do that stuff, you, you could lose your certification. Okay, so it comes up and it shows you the very first question, it tells you it's coming from the renal system, so right then you can decide what do I know about the renal system? Is this something, an area that scares me? And if you're using the Smarty Pants interactive blueprint, you can go ahead and scroll through to the renal section of the blueprint. So I go ahead and get that kind of teed up and ready to go. But say that you got to this content area and it was, you know, like infectious disease and you are just so nervous about infectious disease and feel like that's one of your really weak areas. If you wanted to, you could store this question. So you click down here, this blue button, store question. That means that you can kind of put this question on hold so you can go do some studying or whatever and come back and take this question later. Another thing that the store question is good for is if you are taking this test on a phone or a tablet, it does tell you here if an image is going to be part of the question. So if you're on a very small screen, that may make it difficult to answer the question. So you may want to go ahead and store that question at this time as well. And then here it's got the clock telling you how long you have left to complete the answer. Okay, I'm going to stop the screen recording here and I will come back to you in just a moment. Okay, I'm back and I did it. I did the full test uh, for this quarter, all 25 questions. I would have to say it probably took me a little under two hours. I did time out on one question. I was still frantically trying to verify the answer when the time ran out, but I still got the question right. And the reason is I followed NCCPA's guidance and that they tell you to read the question, read the answers, select an answer, whichever one you think is the best answer, just your gut reaction. You're not going to hit submit at that point, so nothing is recorded. You just have an answer highlighted. Then you can go do all of your checking and looking at your resources and then come back and change the answer if you need to and then hit submit for the final answer. But as long as you have selected an answer, if you time out, if you lose track of time, um, or if you just are frantically looking like I was and still couldn't find what you needed, at least when it times out, if you have an answer selected, you have a chance of getting that answer correct. So just make that part of your good habits when you're taking the test. Now, what did I find for resources? First, I do want to mention that they give you in the test, uh, there is a lab values button that you can click on and it will bring up this list of lab values, but they're in a, a linear form and you have to scroll through and figure out, you know, where the lab is that you need. I found that kind of cumbersome and time consuming, so I would suggest that you have a printed out lab values you can refer to or at least have the tab open on your reference materials. I think you'll find it much easier than trying to use their in-test lab values sheet. Now, for resources, I remember originally I said I was going to use Smarty Pants and Google was my plan. I did use Smarty Pants. It did come in handy on some questions, especially the pearls on how the diseases uh, present. But I have to say Google is definitely the winner. You know, Google is just such a fantastic search engine. I did also find that I referenced Hippocrates a couple times when I needed to get some specific information on medications. So if you have the free Hippocrates, a free or paid Hippocrates, you might uh, want to have that handy. I did not use UpToDate because I don't have access to UpToDate, so I wasn't able to test that for you. I do think just knowing now, having gone through the test, that it would be difficult to find what you need in UpToDate unless you are somebody who is pretty familiar with how UpToDate has everything broken down. If you use UpToDate all the time, you're familiar with where, which section to go to to find exact information you need, UpToDate may be a great resource for you. And overall, I'd have to say there was probably about three or four questions, like if I remember right, that I could not really 100% verify the answer on. I just had to kind of go with my you know, gut instinct and kind of the information I was getting online. 
So that was a little frustrating, but um, that is the, you know, the limitations of the five minutes. You're not always going to find exactly the information to verify the answer. Now, as far as the questions themselves go, I do have to say, I think that the scenarios were often longer than I expected them to be. And there were many second order questions and higher logic questions, meaning that you would you know, read the scenario and you may know exactly what they're talking about for the disease state. But then the question really is about, you know, something about treatment or about risk factors. So you have to be able to read the scenario, understand what disease they're talking about, and then go further in, into knowing something. I do feel like the questions were probably a little harder than I expected based on the reviews that people had given about the pilot test. But you have to take that with a grain of salt because I have been working sporadic locums in occupational medicine for the you know past year, year and a half. So if that's you, or if you're in a specialty where you don't encounter a whole lot of general medicine, or if you have difficulty reading through scenarios quickly and pulling out the points you need to then be able to apply the logic, then you may want to consider doing some studying before you take the test. You have four quarters that you know can kind of be waste quarters. So like I said earlier, you may just take this quarter, just take the questions and see how you do and let that be a barometer for what you need to do in the future. Or you could just do a couple of the questions and see how it is and then make your decision from there. Now, once you submit an answer, you get immediate feedback of whether that question was correct or incorrect. And they do give you some reasoning of why. I thought the reasoning was a little disappointing. There were things I felt like they could explain a little bit better. But you do get that snapshot and some indication of why the answer was the right answer. When you're done with the test, you can go to your um, exam dashboard in NCCPA, and it's a nice dashboard. It'll tell you how many questions you know you missed, how many questions you got right, how many questions are still outstanding, and how many questions you may have stored uh, to go back to later. And at the bottom, it'll have each question broken out by the blueprint section that it comes from. So it, you can easily see what blueprint areas you missed questions in. So that can help you kind of focus any studying you might want to do in the future. Now, of course, it doesn't give you an overall score or if you passed or failed that quarter. They, like I said earlier, they can't determine that until the quarter is over and everyone has taken the test for that quarter. And then it's my understanding that we'll get an email telling us how we did. So overall, do I like this test or not? You know, you'll have to ask me this question again at the end of the two or three years to see if I'm totally fed up with having to keep up with something every quarter. Right now, it seems pretty easy. It is a much more relaxed way to take a test because the only time crunch you're under is when you actually open the question. Then you've got that five minutes. But once you answer the question and close it, then there's no time pressures. You can you know, reflect on that question they just answered and kind of do a little bit more studying about that question if you want to solidify it in your memory. You can kind of just relax, get up and do some stretching. You can go let the dog out. You can have a sip of wine, whatever you want to do, or, or even just leave the test completely and come back to it later. It's not like when you're at a testing center and you're taking the pants or the panry and there's one question after another, just they keep coming and you can't stop them. It's not like that at all. It's much more relaxed and you have much more control. So I do love that aspect about the test. Hey everyone, it's Michelle with The Medicine Couch and the first quarter of the new Panry LA is over. And we've already started the second quarter. I'm seeing a lot of feedback out there from people who have started the second quarter and I wanted to kind of share that with you today. We're also going to talk about the scoring. I'm going to show you where to find your scores and kind of how to interpret them. So kind of talk about chat GPT and if that's something that you can rely on and use to get all of your questions correct. So the first thing is, are the second quarter questions harder? I haven't opened the second quarter yet and taken them, so I can't speak from experience, but I've read many comments and feedback from people who have already taken the second quarter questions. At first, I was a little concerned because I kept seeing people saying, whoa, the second quarter questions are way harder than the first one, and people worried that this test is going to get progressively harder as the quarters go on. I don't think that's the case uh, because later as more and more people responded and shared their feedback, I saw that many people were like, no, my second quarter questions were way easier than the first quarter. So I think it's just kind of random uh, what questions you get assigned. Just know that some quarters there's going to be some harder questions and sometimes you're going to get some easier questions. 
the questions are weighted and the scores do change depending on how hard the question is. So don't freak out if you see people saying that the second quarter was harder or even if you take your test and the second quarter was harder. I think it's going to even out over time. So let's talk about your score, where you find it, and how to interpret it. So to do that, we're going to log into your NCCPA dashboard. You want to go over here to the left and go down to exams. So when you click on exams, it's going to take you to this screen. And it'll tell you what quarter you're in and how many questions you've answered. Because remember, you can open the test, but don't have to do all of the questions at one sitting. Over here on the right, it's going to tell you the due date that this quarter is due and how many days you have left in the quarter, which is handy. Does that math for you? And then down here at the bottom, it shows you your progress. Look here to the cumulative progress to date. And this is going to give you the breakdown of how you did on the content by system. And it's just kind of a visual representation to let you know what areas maybe you need to do some more studying on and brushing up on before you go into the next quarter. And then this will show you your score status. Um, the score ranges from 1,000 to 1,500. This is your score, the top bar in purple. This is the passing score for that quarter. And then below it is the average score. So this will let you know where you're at. You know, if you're out here way above passing, then you know, you've got plenty of wiggle room. Uh, if you're here just close to the passing score or like way below the average, then that would give you indications that that wasn't the greatest quarter. And then maybe you should do some more studying or maybe it was just nerves for the first quarter. But anyway, that's where you keep track of your progress. Now over here on the side, it does say that the scale scores are used to account for the relative difficulty of the questions you receive. And that goes back to what I was talking about, the first versus second quarter questions. There are gonna be harder and easier questions as you move through this and your score um, will reflect the difficulty of your questions. And that's why, like when the scores first came out, people would say, I got, you know, 23 out of 25 correct, and I got a score of 1260. But other people put they got 23 out of 25 correct, and they got a score of 1175, or they got a score of 1270. That's because each question has a scale score, and then that will determine how much your score moves. Interestingly enough, I didn't see anybody, even with a perfect 25 out of 25, that ended up anywhere close to the 1500. Hopefully that doesn't mean that there's some really hard questions out there coming our way. I don't really know why I, no one came close to the 1500. And it could just be that only the few people I saw who posted that got in the, the high 1200s, maybe low 1300s. So if you're somebody who got a 25 out of 25 and you got a score in the 1400s or you know even the very high 1300s, let us know down below. It would be interesting to see kind of what the highest scores were for the first quarter. And then it also says here that your interim score is based on your performance in the quarters you have participated in and will likely change over time. So the interim score is just going to be, I think, one final score at the end. And then here, the opportunities, it talks about um, how to improve your score. And so you can read through this and get a little bit better understanding of the scoring. But before I talk more about the scoring, I want to just remind you of a few good test taking practices. NCCPA says very clearly that if you missed a question in a certain category, that you will see that question again in a different form. Some people said that they had the same exact question, but regardless of whether it's the same or if it's in a different form, you're going to get the same topic again if you missed it the first time. So that means that every quarter you need to go back and you need to review the questions that you have missed previously. Go in and read about that topic a little bit and really understand it so you can be prepared if they ask it in a different way that you can get that question correct. The second one is to remember that when you open a question, read through it, really make sure you understand what the question is asking because some people are getting tripped up with that. So make sure that you know what you're looking for is the first thing. But the second thing is to go ahead and choose your best guess answer. Go ahead and click an answer and then go do your search. 
The reason you want to select an answer first is because if you do time out or if something happens and you lose your internet connection, that question you at least have a chance to get correct if you picked something. Okay, so let's talk about this scoring system. Remember when I showed you on the screen that it said that you have the chance to improve your score and you could click there to get more information about that. And I'll read it exactly how they have worded. Each quarter, starting with the second, five topics are repeated to reinforce existing knowledge and facilitate learning. In these cases, the first attempt is removed from the score and the most recent attempt replaces it. So that's a good thing, right? That means that we have a chance if we miss the question to get it right. Your score is dynamic. It can move the whole two to three years that you're taking this test. So overall, I think we'll have to see as the quarters go and how the scoring goes and see what people are thinking and feeling about this test, like whether they would take it again or not. Right now, I'm like solidly on the fence and we're only at second quarter, so we'll have to see. Last thing I wanted to talk about was the resources. Um, most people reinforce that what I was saying earlier that they are using a searchable blueprint. Uh, I see Hippo mentioned a lot and some people are using Smarty Pants and they're gonna give you the book answers, what the test is looking for. That's why those are so nice to use. They're not gonna be able to give you straightforward answers to every question, but they are really good resources. And then after the first quarter, I'm sure many people decided whether they needed to do an actual review course. If you want a review course, CME for Life is another PA owned and run company. I'll put a link down below in the description box with their website. They've got great options from flashcards to online videos to actual full courses, either online or in person. And so if that's something that you feel like you need, you might check out their course. Now let's talk about chat GPT because this is interesting. I recently just did a whole video series, three videos about AI and medicine. And I think AI is going to be phenomenal and it's going to change our lives in so many ways. But is it ready for you to use now for this test? Is it something that can help you? I saw some feedback of people who tried to use it and they said, don't do it, that there's too many, they missed too many wrong answers because of it. So I went in and did a little trial of it. I used some practice questions and then I put in a few questions from my actual questions I had in the first quarter. Now, unfortunately, I can't, couldn't go back and just copy and paste the questions from the NCCPA site. I don't know if you're able to do that when you're actually taking the test, but I had to kind of retype it and paraphrase it, which is awful and time consuming and probably not something you're going to be able to do during the test. But I just wanted to kind of see if it gave me the right answers. And I would say probably 80 to 90 percent of the time it did give me the right answers. So it wouldn't be terrible to use. But the thing is, when it gives you the answers, it gives you lots of reinforcing information about why that answer is correct. And it may be the correct answer, but it's not the answer that the test is looking for, if that makes sense. When you use the searchable blueprints or even a, you know, a Pants or Panry Pearls book, which people said was also very helpful, and I'll put the link to the, which one they recommended the most um, in the description box. Um, but you know, they've written those resources knowing what the test likes to focus in on, knowing the keywords that they're going to be asking and knowing what the test is looking for, for the most part. Whereas when you're using ChatGPT, it is artificial intelligence. It means it's not just a search engine. It's going to reason through and give you what it thinks is the best answer, which may be the correct answer in practice and in real life, but it's not going to give you the answer that the test is looking for. So that's why I say use ChatGPT with caution. If you do use it, try to double check its answers or just go in knowing with a caveat that you may miss um, a couple based on what looks like pretty solid information. Are you considering taking the Panry LA, but you're just not sure about signing up for a test that can last two to three years? Hmm. Trust me, I completely understand your dilemma because I was there myself last year. I did end up choosing the Panry LA and I just finished my fourth quarter, so one year down, hopefully only one year to go. So in this video, I am going to tell you what I think about the test at the end of one year. And if it's been a real burden having to keep up every quarter with doing a test, and if I regret that I signed up for the Panry LA. 
I'm also going to give a brief tutorial on efficiently and effectively using the Smarty Pants searchable blueprint. I've heard some people say that they found it a little confusing or they thought it took a lot of clicks to find what they needed, but I don't find that. I think it's a great resource and I'm going to show you the two tools that I use in Smarty Pants to find pretty much all the answers that I need. I'm also going to share test taking tips with you. I'll repeat some of the ones that I had talked about in previous videos, but I'm going to add a few new ones that I picked up in the last couple of quarters. So let's talk about this test First, I think some people may not understand why I say two to three years. You pass the test by passing eight quarters of the exam. So you do one set of 25 questions every three months, every quarter of the year. And so the quickest that you can get done is in two years. But they realize that sometimes things come up and you may not be able to get to your questions in a quarter, maybe a really busy quarter. You have a big event in your life and you don't even want to deal with it. You don't have to take it every quarter, or it may be that you don't pass a quarter. So they give you four extra quarters to be able to have some flexibility. So the minimum amount of time to take the test is two years. The maximum time is three years. I thought I'm just going to be thinking about this thing all the time. It's going to feel like another big weight or to do on my list of things. And life is already busy enough. And Yes, it is something I have to do every quarter. And the first couple of quarters, it was a little bit more obnoxious and, and on my mind more. But honestly, the last two quarters, I haven't even thought about the test until the, towards the end of the quarter. Some people do it right away the first of the quarter and get it done with, and they don't think about it for the next two quarters. I kind of do the opposite. I procrastinate. I don't think about it at all for the first two quarters. And then when I get that email from NCCPA saying, hey, you know, you've got one more month to finish this quarter, I'll be like, okay, I got to go in and do some questions. Typically do it all in one setting. Sometimes I break it up and, you know, if I, if I have a few minutes, I'm not doing something else, I'll answer a few questions. But usually I'll just do all 25 in one sitting. And even if I spent the total of five minutes that you are given for each question, that's still only two hours of time pretty much max. I don't spend any additional time studying or reviewing before I take the test. I just sit down and do it, which I think is how most people do it. So if you look at it, two hours, once a quarter, that's eight hours a year, 16 hours max for two years. I don't find it that much of a burden. I think it's fine. Sure, I would like to work ahead or, you know, be done with it in a year, but it is what it is. And I think the 25 question block is is pretty nice. It's it's enough to get a big chunk done every quarter, but it's not too much to really stress you out. And I think most people that I'm seeing online agree with it. They're loving the Pan Real A and then they think this is the best option and everyone should pick it. But I have seen some people that have a different opinion. Some people say they absolutely hate it. They would never choose it again. They regret that they chose it. And for those that don't like it, mainly it comes into two categories. One is their life is just too busy and having to do something, even if it's only a couple hours every quarter, something they have to keep up with, they just don't want to do it. They think it's just too much. You know, they'd rather just do it in one day and get it all done and do the traditional pan read. For other people, they say that they took the pan relay because they have test anxiety. And while it's easier to take the test at home, they're realizing that instead of having test anxiety for a day and it gets relieved and they don't have to think about it for 10 more years, now they've traded that for a little bit of test anxiety every quarter for two years. I understand their point, um, but I would say if you have test anxiety really bad to the point where you kind of go blank when you're in a testing center, even if there's a little anxiety spread out over the quarters, I think you would still do better taking the Panry LA at home. So overall, I prefer the Panry LA over the Panry. But if you want to take the Panry, it has its pros also. It is nice to be able to get it done, not to think about for 10 years. But if you're going to take the Panry, you're probably going to need to take a review course or at least spend quite a few hours studying beforehand. If you want to take a review course, I highly recommend CME for Life. And again, another PA run company, and I think that their CME is fantastic. It's engaging and as entertaining as medical education can be, and also gives you great ways to remember things. 
So I'll put a link to their website below if you want to check out their course. And I'm happy to say I can also offer you a discount where you can save a little bit of money if you're going to sign up for the course. Now, I think if you're taking the Pan LA that you need to identify what your resource is going to be and just use that every time, get familiar with it. I know a lot of people use Google and Google will work just fine. I like a more specific source. So I like Smarty Pants Searchable Blueprint. It doesn't have 100% of everything I need, but I can find most of the answers in there. Now, let's do a quick tutorial here. I'll use one of the Smarty Pants practice questions. When you sign up for their membership, you get a lot of different things to study with. But all I really use it for is the searchable blueprint and then this rapid search button. So when I get ready to take the test, I have Smarty Pants opened. And I will go in and I will open in a tab the searchable blueprint. And then in a separate tab, I'll also open this rapid search bar. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I have this open and ready to go. I got my lab value source open. The question tells me what system it's going to be in. So then I make sure that in the blueprint, I open that particular system and I see all the conditions listed there for that system. And so if I think I know what the answer is, then I'll just click on that particular condition and then this will pop up. Now, I think this is where somebody thought it was kind of confusing. The first page that pops up, sometimes there'll be a little video there or a lecture or a diagram or something. And then they scroll down and they'll see some wording and then they'll see practice questions. They're like, I don't, I don't want all that. I think it's just a matter of that they're not familiar with the setup of it. Whatever resource you're using, you should get familiar with it before you start using it. So on this first page here, sometimes it will have a diagram or a video or something that, that pulls up. I scroll past that really quickly. That paragraph there, that is going to be the description. It's going to be the vignette that they're presenting you with not going to match the vignette in your question, but what they've done is in their vignette, they've included and bolded all of the specific words and phrases that go along with that condition. You know, NCCPA, they have to, when they write the question, they have to give you those words and phrases that are going to point you in the right direction. And Smarty Pants is going to have that listed there as well. Oftentimes, they're going to match word for word. Sometimes they'll be just a little bit different, but it will definitely be very similar. So that is where you find the description. But what if you want something that's a little bit more specific? Then you can click here on the pearls, and it's going to list other information associated with that disease. Or if the question is asking about treatment or diagnosis, you can click on these other tabs here. So it's separated out. To me, it's very logical and methodical. It starts with presentation, extra pearls and things that you might need to know. And then it's got treatment and diagnosis. So very simple to use. But what happens if you read the vignette and you like, I don't know which of these conditions it's talking about? Well, you could look up each particular one, but that's going to take you some time. So that's where this rapid search comes in handy. You can take the most specific and unique phrasing from that vignette, like this one, and then you take that and you go to your tab with the rapid search and you type in that specific thing. And it's going to pull up any conditions that those keywords match. Sometimes it's just going to be one or two conditions. Sometimes it'll be several. But you, are, again, remember what system you're in. So then when you've identified what you think matches in the category you're at, you'll see here that the condition is also still a searchable link. So then you can click on that searchable link and it will take you to all of that information about the condition. So then you can verify that your answer is correct. I didn't even know about this feature for the first couple of quarters. Uh, so I was just using the searchable blueprint. But then when I discovered this, it really is a nice adjunct to the searchable blueprint and a really helpful tool. I hope you can see how efficient and effective Smarty Pants Searchable Blueprint is. If you like this and want to use it as a resource, I, again, highly recommend it. It's a PA-owned and run company. Uh, Steve Pasquini owns it. He's been doing great work for years helping people prepare for the pants and the pantry. And I think he's done a fabulous job on this blueprint. So I love to support PA-owned and run companies. So I'll put the link to their website down below and I thankfully have a discount code for them as well. But some people prefer books, so I'll put some links down below to the ones that are going to help you the most. 
So let's get to the test taking tips. I'm going to quickly run through ones that I had mentioned before. One tip is to make sure you've got two screens that you're using. Second one is make sure you have your own lab value sheet. There's one provided in the exam, but I don't like it at all. I don't think it's very helpful. Third is if you have a long vignette, I read the ending first, you know what they're asking for. And then the most important one is make sure you have an answer selected. Read the question, select your best answer, and then if you need to research, go research. The reason you want to do that is if the test times out or your computer glitches, your internet goes down, whatever happens, you at least have a chance to get the answer right because you selected an answer. Otherwise, it's going to be marked wrong automatically. Now let's dive into some of the, the test taking tips I've learned since the last video I did. And the first one is, like I said earlier, think about the system that you're being tested over. I kind of had to laugh because there was one question that I read it. I thought I knew what the answer was. You know, what's the answer? I think I think it's that one. But there was another one. It's like, oh, that might be it too. And I was debating and I was just getting ready to go do some, you know, searching for it. And then it hit me. It's like, oh, well, the answer that I think it is, that's the only one that's actually listed in the blueprint under that system I'm being tested over. The other ones are all in different systems. So they're obviously not going to be the answer. So I didn't even have to spend any time searching and I had confirmation that was the right answer. It's helpful to always remember what system you're being tested in. Second, like I said earlier, identify and search for those unusual facts that are going to be present. The one thing that's going to distinguish that from anything else, this may be quite obvious, but just in case people aren't sure how to search for stuff, even if it's asking you like for the next best steps or, you know, what imaging you need and things, you have to know what the diagnosis is first. And to get to that diagnosis, you're going to be identifying those most unusual aspects and searching for those. Third, if you think you know what the answer is, but you're kind of OCD like me and you like to get exact confirmation that the answer you chose is right, sometimes it's hard because you're not going to find the exact des description the way it's described in the vignette. So I used to spend a lot of time then going to Google and trying to find it in other resources and getting frustrated and you pull something up and it's got different pop-ups or you can't find you know, where it's referencing this particular condition or whatever. And I would just get annoyed and spend a lot of time spinning my wheels for that. I finally got smart and realized that I can look at the other answers. I can look them up quickly in the blueprint and oftentimes knock out the other answers or sometimes the description in that answer will, will point back to your original answer or to the correct answer. So don't forget that you can use the other answers even if you think they're wrong, to help confirm your right answer. And finally, this is a tip that I don't particularly use, but I've seen people mention online, and they batch questions from their weakest system. So for those of you who don't know, in the exam, NCCPA allows you to basically skip a question. You can batch it and put it away for later. It can be later that session, or you can actually exit out the test and go back in later, and that question will still be held to the side. Now, you don't get to see what the question is. You only get to know what category it's going to be in. So that's why I say people identify their weakest system, the one that they feel like they really need to do some more studying on, and they just feel a little extra stress over that system. So they'll go through taking the test. They'll answer question one, two, three, and then they get to question four, and it says, oh, this question is going to be in psych. And they think, psych's not my thing. I don't even want to deal with it right now. They'll just put it, they'll just batch it, and then they'll go on to question five and, you know, so on. And so then later, you can go back at a later date and you can study the system, the different things in the blueprint for that system, do a little studying and learning, and then dive in and take those questions. Again, I don't use that, but I, I can see how it can be helpful for some people. Now, if you want to learn more about CME for Life, which is the course that I highly recommend you take if you want to do any kind of review course before taking the PANRI LA or the traditional PANRI, then you can watch this video here where I actually interviewed John Belinsky, who is the PA that owns and runs CME for Life. Well, I hope all this has been informative and helpful for you, and I wish you all the best in whichever test you decide to take. Thanks for joining me today, and as always, take care, stay sane, and I'll see you next time on The Medicine Couch. Bye.